Good afternoon, doctors. Welcome to our webinar this afternoon titled ENT Practice in COVID-19. We are coming to you live from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. I hear that we have doctors from Philippines, a big group of you, Malaysia, Singapore, and many other countries. And some of you are still signing on, so we'll see the numbers go up soon. This webinar will be recorded and you'll be made available for those who are not able to join us today on the website www.entspecialistclinic.com. Today, we will be hearing from our panelists on the best practices and preventive actions that ENT specialists need to take during this pandemic. There will be discussions on the best cases that can be operated on safely. We will also discuss, um, there will be a dialogue to discuss economic options and impact on ENT practice. During this session, if you have any questions that you would like our panelists to address, please send us your questions at the YouTube chat below. I would like to begin the webinar by introducing our panelists this afternoon. Dato Dr. Kujit Singh, ENT Specialist Medical Director of Prince Court Medical Center, one of the founders of ENT Summit and current president of the Association of Private Hospitals Malaysia. Dato Dr. Kujit Singh is instrumental in leading Malay the Malaysian private hospitals to support our government in Malaysian public hospitals during this pandemic. Our panelist from Singapore is Associate Professor J.K. Xiao. He is a Clinical Associate Professor of Otorhinolaryngology from Yong Lu Lin School of Medicine, National University of Singapore, Lee Kong Chan School of Medicine, Nanyang Technological University, Singapore, and Senior Consultant in Otorhinolaryngology, Tan Tok Seng Hospital, Singapore. Professor Xiao's subspecialty of interest is in endoscopic sinus surgery, image guidance in sinus surgery, and anterior skull base surgery. He has been a teaching faculty for endoscopic sinus surgery courses and a conference speaker regionally and internationally for the past 30 years. More importantly, he was awarded the Commendation Medal, Pingat Kapujian, by the President of Singapore for his work in containing and eliminating SARS-CoV-1 in Singapore in 2003. Our next panelist is Professor Dr. Baharudin Abdullah, who is joining us from Kota Baru, Malaysia. He is a senior consultant in the Department of Otorhinolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery in University Science Malaysia. Professor Dr. Baharudin is an honorary visiting scholar at Chinese University of Hong Kong and Asian Surgical Association Clinical Fellow Head and Neck Surgery from University of Hong Kong as well. He was a fellow in rhinology and endoscopic sinus surgery in University of Graz, Austria, and senior fellow of Head and Neck Optical Diagnostics and Intervention Society. Professor Baharudin is on the editorial board of several international medical journals. He has published widely in allergy, rhinology, and head and neck surgery in several international and national journals, and has presented many scientific studies and papers, both at the national and international level. He is currently the president-elect of Malaysian Society of Allergy and Immunology. Last but not least, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jivanan Jahindran. After completing his Master's in Otorhinolaryngology from University of Kebangsaan, Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur, Dr. Jivanan served as a lecturer and consultant ENT surgeon in Hospital University Kebangsaan, Malaysia for a few years. Currently, he works at the Pantai Hospital Group in both the Kuala Lumpur and Chiras hospitals. He has always had a special interest in the nose and its associated conditions, but since 2012, he has taken up an avid interest in sleep-related breathing disorders. He is a passionate advocate of education, both in creating public awareness and teaching medical professionals. He has served as the president of Malaysian Society of Otorhinolaryngologists, Head and Neck Surgeons. He organized the inaugural ASEAN Sleep Congress in 2012 and the Asian Research Symposium in Rhinology in Kuala Lumpur in 2016. He is currently dedicated in bringing a whole new concept of managing the upper airway in an integrated manner through bridging multiple specialties. With that brief introduction completed, I would like to begin the afternoon by inviting Dr. Koji to give us a short overview of the current situation in Malaysia and the potential steps that is in store. Dr. Koji, please. Thank you, uh, Didi, and uh, good afternoon to all of those who have logged in today. Um, it is interesting that uh, we are facing something that no one has actually expected. Uh, definitely, nine of us have seen such, an epidemic, uh, such a pandemic. The pandemic started in December in China and uh, it was 
kind of postulated that this will not go beyond China. But unfortunately, it has gone to many Asian countries. It has affected Southeast Asia, and now we have it in a very big way in the United States and many parts of Europe. In Malaysia, in the month of March, we introduced the MCO, what means is a Movement Control Order, in which that the entire business uh, of the day-to-day -day, uh, activities of our people were restricted. And that include that healthcare, especially in the non-COVID uh, treatment of some of our patients. We have no elective uh, procedures that were allowed, but uh, as time went by, some electives are beginning to be given some leeway. But the question here is, we as ENT surgeons, uh, what do we do? Because we do have uh, patients that require uh, surgeries, uh, they may be emergencies, some could be electives. How long do we wait uh, with our elective patients? Uh, do we wait after the MCO is over or do we wait entirely after the pandemic is over? What would be our choice of surgeries that we can do in ENT? Remember that we are looking, we are treating most of our patients through the airway and we know that the airway is where the most amount of uh, infection that could occur and we are considered to be high risk. Is it ethical for us to keep postponing our patients? If the MCO goes on for another one month, maybe another two months, do we keep postponing them? You know ENT surgeries are only done after medical therapy has been optimized. We can keep them for a month, we can keep them for six weeks, there are times that we cannot keep patients beyond that. Even though ENT surgeries may seem to be trivial, may not seem to be a great emergency except for foreign body epistaxis and some uh, ENT cancers. So we thought that this would be the best time because we have read so many different uh, guidelines from all over the world. We have guidelines from the United States, we have guidelines from the UK, and uh, we would like to have uh, an open discussion on this. Uh, how do we start? We have to start somewhere. And if we are going to start, how we are going to protect ourselves, how we are going to protect our other healthcare workers who are going to be with us when we are going to treat uh, ENT patients. So I would like to end here with my introduction and uh, perhaps we'll, let's listen to the panel and then we'll have some discussion uh, after that. Thank you, Dr. Kujit. Um, thank you for laying down the foundation for today's webinar. Professor Dr. Xiao, from your past experience in dealing with SARS-CoV-1 in Singapore in 2003, can you share with us the signs of prevention of infection and recommended PPE? Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Kojit, for inviting me to come and share our experiences uh, at this webinar. Well, um, I thought we must first know the enemy. So uh, let's get down to how all these uh, guidelines came about. Uh, next slide, please. I work in Tan Tock Seng Hospital. We are right next to the NCID, the place where we treat COVID-19 cases. And by January, I had to write to, uh, I had to write to Kuji to tell him that I couldn't come for the EAT summit because there was action going on. So I happened to park my car underneath the COVID-19 wards. And so I think Kujit figured that I would know something. Yeah. So next, please. Let's start off with this uh, very famous case where all the uh, Western literature usually introduce uh, the recommendations with. They say that there was a patient who underwent endoscopic pituitary surgery and 14, patient, 14 healthcare workers in the operating theater were infected uh, with COVID-19. So I do pituitary surgery, so I thought well, this is disastrous because if this could happen, that's the end of, uh, end of surgery for, for, my, uh, for my self-speciality. So we decided to investigate this. Uh, next slide, please. Next, please. Uh, we got this article. It's actually not from a peer-reviewed journal. It's from a journalistic article from uh, uh, Newsweek in China. And uh, we got it translated. Actually, the story in detail is that this patient, we think it is a female patient, maybe middle-aged, she was admitted to hospital for 12 days for cardiac optimization before her surgery. 
and she spent another five days after surgery before they isolated her. So she actually had 17 days in the hospital. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. Out of the 14 infected healthcare workers, 10 were nursing staff. Now, it couldn't be that there were 10 nurses in the operating theater during the operation. Right? These were probably nurses who cared for the patient when she was in the three wards. The other four doctors who were uh, infected was the cardiologist and cardiothoracic surgeon involved in optimizing her, and a pediatrician and ONG, probably doctors who saw her in the ward. There is no mention that a neurosurgeon performing the surgery was infected. Of course, there was no ENT infection because neurosurgeons do their skull base without ENT surgeons in China. So people like me and Prabhupada Karan, we are not needed in China. Okay, next slide, please. So, therefore, this, uh, this super spreader in, in surgery is probably a bit overstated. Yeah? Understandably so because of the language, etc. And so this had prompted the uh, Western literature to have uh, very strong recommendations for endoscopic sinus surgery. Next slide, please. So these are the recommendations. In Stanford, they ask that COVID-19 testing be done first before any surgery. And in UK, you wear N99, and uh, another group in America to stratify into high risk or low risk. So let's go through what we mean, do we mean by PPE. Next slide, please. Now, the level one is something we named in our hospital. It is something that all of us have been using. Right? We use a surgical mask. We wear uh, spectacles, right, which is actually not airtight. Yeah. And then, of course, cap, gloves, shoe cover, and the fluid-resistant gown. Now, at level two, look at Stavdas on, on the picture. She's wearing what we call level two. She's wearing an N95 mask, and she's wearing airtight goggles. That is the addition we have to put in for level two. And, of course, level three uh, is a powered air purifying respirator. Okay, next. And this level two is what we wear when we go to NCID to screen for patients with COVID-19. We also wear this when we do nasal endoscopies in our clinic. Next slide. So this is level three where we are fitted with a helmet and where uh, it is fitted to a respirator that helps to purify the air as we conduct surgery. But it is pretty cumbersome. And of course, it's expensive. Yeah. Next slide, please. So let's now learn to know our enemy. As surgeons, you will know that when you cut on the skin, diatomy, you sometimes smell smoke. Yeah? When you smell smoke through your surgical mask, you're not dead yet. Yeah? The smoke that comes through comes by an explosion from the diatomy, and it's actually much smaller than the uh, virus, which is 0 0.1 micron. Yeah? As you know, when you wear a surgical mask, it is to filter bacteria from you to the patient. So it would work for bacteria, but it wouldn't work for a virus. Okay. Okay. Next slide, please. But how does the virus spread? It spreads mainly by droplets. Droplets are big, right? uh, five microns and above. They come when someone coughs out, yeah? and the droplets then go down to the surfaces. Yeah. Um, it can exist as an aerosol, but in a, in a closed drum, it can exist for three hours in an aerosol, but in, in practical terms, this usually doesn't happen because um, air flows, ventilation flows, and the viruses are swept away. So most of the infection occurs from droplets, and droplets have gone on surfaces. Next slide, please. Now for surfaces, in NCID, um, after the patient has left the room, there was uh, active swabbing of these areas, and we found most of the viruses go live, uh, will be, can be found up to 48 hours, 72 hours on the floor, in the air vent that you can see above, on the bed reel which the patient has touched, on the electric switch, the table you see there, the locker handle you see there, which the table, patient has touched, on the chair and also in a toilet seat and flush. Right. Next slide, please. So that's why in Singapore, 
we send uh, people out to spray disinfectants onto HDB lift buttons, something that people press a lot. And you know that it is a pandemic when you can catch something that can live on a doorknob for 48 hours, you touch it and you infect yourself and you can die from it. That is a pandemic that we are dealing with. Next slide. So for a surgeon then, surfaces are very important and it has been, it was shown in Wuhan that uh, when we are changing our protective gear, changing our PPE, this is a time when you can catch the COVID from the, that has settled on to your protective gear. Yeah, so be careful there. Next slide. So why is an N95 good enough? We know from uh, uh, work done with SARS, the first COVID, SARS, um, surgical masks and N95 were effective in preventing transmission. N95 is an industrial standard. Um, it means that 95% of particles, 0 0.3 microns in diameter, are, are excluded from uh, coming in through the mask. Uh, for cough droplets, etc., they are much bigger. So N95 works. Next slide, please. And so, um, we, we say we, they have this focus on 0 0.3 microns because 0 0.1 microns, even if it comes onto your N95 mask, cannot get through. Right? It's too, too light. You cannot get through. You must hang on to something about 3, 0 0.3 microns before it can penetrate the mask. And that is why uh, the N95 mask can work. Yeah. Next slide, please. So, as a recap then, what we would recommend is to use level 2, an N95 mask, and, and airtight goggles over your spectacles, and of course the cap, the gloves, and the fluid-resistant uh, gown. Next slide. So this is my brief introduction and my acknowledgement to my colleagues. Thank you. Yep. Shall we go to the next speaker then? Oh. Thank you, Professor Xiao. That was a very, very concise and um, very direct um, explanation, very clear, and I really appreciate it. Next, Professor Baharudin, please share with us your personal opinion on how to select cases which can be operated on during this period of time due to the presence of COVID-19. Thank you, Didi, for moderating. Thank you also, Dr. Koji, for uh, organizing this um, uh, session. I think it's timely because um, everybody probably is thinking about the same thing about what we are doing here now, about what to do, uh, do's and don'ts probably during this um, peak season of COVID-19. Well, um, in my lifetime, probably this, probably for everybody's lifetime, probably, uh, this is quite an unprecedented uh, event because um, I remember watching the movie uh, Contagion um, the movie was, I think, came out uh, in 2013, and it was very similar to what we are experiencing uh, now in Malaysia, whereby uh, we can see soldiers uh, on the roadside blocking people from traveling and whatnot, similar to what we are experiencing during the, um, uh, at, at the moment now with the M MCO. Um, so, um, what, 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 what should we do with our patient? As Dr. Kujit mentioned just now, uh, we can't delay them forever. We can't uh, delay those cases that uh, have to be operated. Um, you know, uh, and uh, what we should bear in mind also is that um, after the MCO doesn't mean that the COVID season is going to be over. So what do we do? We can't just delay forever, right? Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Right, so um, I don't know whether you uh, know about this comment from our respected Director General of Health, um, which says that he commented and says that 
uh, most healthcare workers uh, acquire uh, COVID infection not through the COVID ward because sometimes we are always scared to take care of COVID patients because uh, we might get infection from them. But most healthcare workers, at least in Malaysia, uh, acquired the infection not from the COVID patient. They actually got it from the non-COVID ward and outside the hospital. So what does that mean? Probably because you know, we are not taking proper care, proper safety measures to protect ourselves. And uh, you know, the being in the NT, and you know what happened in Wuhan, um, some of the, those doctors that, are, that were infected, most majority of them are actually, uh, those are dealing with the areas like anesthetics, and also um, the ENT surgeon, as well as the, um, uh, the ophthalmologist. Probably because we are dealing with the airway, we are dealing with um, uh, procedures in, involving exposures to the mucosal surfaces. So I think probably it's a good idea for us to have this kind of approach or mentality that um, we should always treat um, non-COVID as COVID so that we have or we can adopt uh, proper safety measures before we um, uh, treat our patients. And I think it goes without saying, as been mentioned by Prof. Xiao just now, um, you know, um, uh, I think Prof. Dr. Kujit, uh, that when you want to bring the patient to operating theater, it is compulsory for us to do a pre-operative COVID test because the implication is huge. Because you know the, the thing is you never know the patient whether they, is, they are positive or not until and unless you test. And um, by and large, it has been shown that in Wuhan, at least uh, specifically in Wuhan, uh, about 85% of patients are asymptomatic. That is from Wuhan. But um, in UK, uh, there's a center that um, doing this, uh, collecting the evidence-based medicine uh, data, and they actually have uh, even more, uh, a larger figure than that. They uh, actually mentioned that the asymptomatic patients can go up to 80%. Can you imagine that 80% are asymptomatic? And if you don't treat them as, you know, take proper measures and whatnot, you don't treat them as COVID patient, you bring this patient to the operating theater, what will happen? The operating theater will be contaminated and then you're going to involve a lot of transmission to the hospital staff and hospital worker. And the implication, implication is huge. And what we can prevent is actually just by doing a pre-operative COVID test to test them before we bring them to the operating theater. And as I mentioned, uh, those procedures, most ENTs will be dealing with this kind of procedures whereby there be um, this uh, aerosol generating procedures, exposure of the airway, exposure of the mucosal surfaces, and this considered as high risk. Right, wherever you are, wherever, whether you are in the clinic, in the operating theater, and even more when you are in the operating theater because you're going to do a lot of uh, invasive procedures. Um, so those will be the high risk procedures. And when uh, we say that we want to proceed, whether we want to proceed or not, certain cases probably we can't delay and we can't delay the patients forever. And when we want to proceed, then we must proceed with extra caution. As I mentioned again, again and again, we take proper measures before we do anything uh, in this sort of uh, situations. Next slide, please. Right, so um, when we um, bring the patients to OT, the, the highest cases are these kind of cases. Intubation, extubations of patients, uh, those are the high risk procedures. Um, tracheostomy, um, mentioned by Prof. Xiao, the endoscopic synonymous skull based surgeries, uh, mastoid and also ear surgeries, and also upper reduction of facial fractures. By and large, I think probably this is the majority of the procedures that um, the ENT or the RN surgeons or RN physician will be dealing with. Um, so when we are dealing with these sort of uh, cases, even though, even though uh, those patients are actually negative or don't have any symptoms at all, we and all the healthcare staff that are in their operating theater must be properly protected by wearing this PPE, 
the personal protective uh, equipment or gear to protect themselves. And also the operating theater will be, have to be designed as a negative pressure to keep the infection in and not going outside and contaminate the, uh, if there is an infection to contaminate uh, the outside uh, 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 space of the operating theater. And also when you are doing these sort of cases, bear in mind uh, the risk of using instruments such as the powered instruments, the powered instrument as mercury brider has been shown that this sort of instrument actually is um, even higher risk because they actually, when we use it, can spread the droplets, right? They generate, uh, um, the aerosol is even more wider area to cover. Of course, they can splash blood, uh, the droplets on your, uh, the, the, your protective gear, your surfaces. Pros, uh, Sia mentioned the high risk is when you change your gear and whatnot, where you're going to be in touch with that, um, uh, the, uh, the mucus, uh, the, um, the droplets and whatnot. And, and also it has been um, feared that um, they, when we are using the powered instruments, um, you know, when you uh, injure the mucous surfaces and whatnot, this might lead to the risk of aerolizing the blood stream. Uh, it has not been shown that um, COVID can be transmitted by bloodstream. But then again, there are a lot of things that we don't know at this time, at this point of time. So I think that's what we should be keeping in mind and always be careful when we are doing these sort of cases. And I think uh, when we are doing cases, what has been mentioned, there are a lot of literatures now being published on COVID-19. Some come from Singapore, Hong Kong, and all over the world. What they mention is, the time that you spend in, in the OT must be efficient. That means as short as possible with the most highly trained team to do the work so that you don't delay the surgery, you don't delay your uh, exposure times and whatnot to the patient and to the, um, uh, you know, the, um, uh, the airway, the droplets and whatnot. Can I have the next slide, please? And so you, you can see that pictures there, uh, a picture there shows that this is in my operating theater whereby uh, my colleagues actually um, was there asked by the anesthetist and the, in a difficult airway situation whereby they feared that they might not be able to intubate the patient and just by waiting, waiting, this the trochanter has not been done yet, but just by waiting they have already properly gear up because you never know. Uh, when uh, the anesthetist is intubating, trying to intubate and whatnot, these are the sort of cases, uh, the sort of situation that you might be exposed to infection. And this is how you look like, uh, I'm not sure how you look at it like that, to me like an astronaut, uh, but it's well protected with the, um, you know, the, the um, uh, protective, um, uh, uh, you know, gown, uh, the uh, protective um, uh, face, uh, um, uh, and the mask, N95 mask, the surgical mask as well, and also the gown with the boot as well. And it's properly protected, I would say. Um, and actually, it's the best interest of all parties actually, actually to adopt safe practice. Um, not only for the healthcare provider. You know, healthcare provider, we always say that why are you becoming so alarmist? Uh, because you don't want to contaminate yourself. It's not only that. We are protecting ourselves and we're protecting everybody because hospital needs healthcare workers. They cannot provide optimal service if the healthcare workers are affected. This will jeopardize and also compromise the best hospital, I um, mean the hospital service. And if there is no a good hospital service, the patient care will be affected as well. So that is why I said, it is in the best interest of everybody to practice safe practice, right? And also, you know that it has been shown that if any of the common people uh, being uh, infected, they spread, this is what they call the RO, the measure of spread, the risk of spread to the, um, to the other people. Uh, the common people, they will, uh, can infect one person, can infect three other people. Whereas when the healthcare worker, uh, when they are infected, 
they can infect about to eight, eight, up to eight people, right? Up to eight people. And that is what happened in Italy. Italy has one of the highest rate of infected and also death in the world. And some of them are actually because of the uh, healthcare workers. You know, probably healthcare workers, they're more in contact, uh, more uh, exposed to the other people, to the patients and whatnot, and they tend to infect more people than the common people, right? So I think this is what we should also keep in mind. And when we do all this, protect ourselves, and also we protect everybody and prevent the collapse of the healthcare system. And it is paramount important to maintain a good, the good health and strength of the the, um, uh, the um, healthcare workers, the workforce, um, because when you are going to war, Prof. Sia mentioned about uh, the enemy, COVID-19 is the enemy. When you go to war, you need elite team, you need very good team for you to go to war, to win the war, right? So you in COVID-19 war, we also need a good team to deal with this kind of situation. Uh, that's all for me. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Professor Baharudin, for the very practical advice you just shared with all of us. Dr. Jivanan, as a private practice ENT specialist, how do you balance between economics and patient care? I hand over to you. Hi, good evening, everyone. And uh, thanks, Kuljit, for organizing this and roping me in as usual. And um, it's, it's great to be here. And Nothing surprising that Kuljit gives me a topic which I have no reference point to talk about. So I have to give a small disclaimer here that whatever I've said or whatever I'll be saying in the next short few minutes will be based on what uh, is based on my personal experience and plus um, some data which I've just collected from a few of my practicing colleagues in private practice. So balancing the scale of economics and patient care. I think what we really need to understand is, um, is in terms of patient care right now, it's not going to change much. We still have to treat our patients. But in terms of how COVID-19 is going to change the picture right now during the MCO and what's going to come in the future, I think that's where the big concern is. So I'm going to break up this into two, um, the clinics and the operating theater. So in the clinic settings, it's very good to have a stratification system for your patients, whether they are, they, because right now across the board, We've been told not to deal with um, high-risk patients or you know those patients with uh, ILI influenza-like illness symptoms or even those which are very suspect of uh, you know reason travel and stuff like that. So I think it's a very good idea, at least during this MCO or in the next couple of months, to risk stratify our patients. And like what Baha said, the best way is everybody has COVID positive until proven otherwise. So this is going to change the way we adapt our practice. So adaptation of our clinical practice, especially in private practice, will be a new norm in the post-COVID era, the way I see it. So it's how things changed when HIV infection came in and the whole concept of universal uh, precaution came in. I think some element of that is going to come in into the future. So um, there are two ways of looking at it, whether we're going to go into a very uh, broad approach, like you know, universal precaution for every patient we're going to see, or it's going to be a symptom-centric precaution. So this is where when you talk about symptom uh, from a low risk to a high risk, if it's low risk, you can categorize your kind of protection that you're going to wear. If it's high risk, you can upgrade your level of protection that you're going to wear. But I think there should be a basic minimum. And one very good thing is, is the use of screening questionnaires. And I've adopted one that has been uh, put forth from the Sarawak group, from Tang Yingping and his group, which is absolutely very, very uh, complete set of questionnaires. So even when they come to the clinic, when they're registering, they go through these questionnaires. So this will help you with risk stratification. And of course, the big question of whether COVID test is going to be performed or not. So what all this is going to equate to in terms of cost. Next slide, please. So if you look at this, this is based from the JAMA article that basically risk stratifies our patients. So non-procedure encounters in, from low risk to moderate risk, you can see that it's very, very clear cut that when we talk about high risk patients and in a non-interventional setting, you're going to have N95 mask. On top of that, you're going to have goggles or a face shield to allow reusable of reusing your N95 mask. You're going to have gowns, gloves, 
surgical mask, double gloving, all this now is going to be all about cost now. Next slide. Then in ENT specifically, when we talk about aerosol generating procedures, and if you look at this, office-based nasal and laryngeal endoscopy, drainage of peritonsal abscess, placement of nasal packing, foreign body management, uh, changing of tracheostomy tube, tracheostomy care. Now, we all know that, you know, the whole big hype about uh, aerosol generating procedures. And just look at this. For low risk, you're already talking about N95 mask, eye protection, uh, surgical mask with goggles, gown, double gloving. You, with high risk, it's going to be a PAPR, single use N95, gown, double gloves. Now, this is going to bring in a huge cost as far as outpatient setting goes. Next slide, please. So additional items you're going to now talk about in a clinic setting. Now, we talked about aerosolization and droplets. So again, with every patient, you're going to talk about sanitizing or, or cleansing your room. So you're going to have additional costs in terms of disinfectant, surgical wipes. You're going to reduce the number of uh, you know, surfaces that needs to be disinfected in terms of droplets. And then we may want to consider at least an air filtration or an air purification system in your clinic, a, a good system that will actually reduce the, the risk, may not take away completely, but you know, whatever little helps will help. And then I think the next thing that we need to look at is UV light cleaning systems. I mean, this has shown to reduce the infection rate or, or rather to clean systems up by almost about 99.9%. .9%. And they are very nice new portable system coming up, but again, cost. And when we look at these costs, who's going to bear the cost? Next slide, please. So if you look at the overall cost in clinic, the cost burden in private healthcare setup, especially in an outpatient setup, who's going to take it up? If it's going to be a patient, as it is, even before pre-COVID, you've got your scope, your instrumentation, and that itself was already a big cost to it. And now if you're going to factor in this cost, a patient's going to be willing to take up this cost. One good example, when we talked about inpatient, and maybe I'll talk about it a bit later. So when we talk about cost, should patients be further burdened by this? The next question is, will insurance cover the added cost? Maybe uh, Kuljit may have some comments on this later as APHM president. Because right now we are talking about outpatient setting. The cover for outpatient is already limited as it is. You throw in all these additional costs, whether it's fixed or consumable cost, it's anybody's guess. In the long run, I know what the insurance companies are going to do. The easiest thing for them to do is to increase insurance premiums, which will come in the next year or so. And should the healthcare, uh, should the healthcare worker himself absorb the cost or should it be shared with the hospital? Right now, I think a lot of us are actually absorbing the cost because number one, the numbers of our patients are still low and we can actually think about absorbing the cost. But when the MCO is lifted, when more patients start coming in and we have to start using more and more things, I, I really don't know, it's anybody's guess where this is going to go. Next slide, please. So now let's go into the inpatient and operative costs, running costs. Now, in my hospital, any admission now is mandatory, they require COVID testing. So any patient who is admitted, whether as an inpatient for any, um, you know, either for treating, let's say, you know, um, tonsillitis or anything like that, or sinusitis acute just for medication alone needs to be tested for COVID positive. I mean, COVID test. Now, if you're admitting a patient for an emergency case or an uh, elective case, all these patients need testing. Again, some part of it now the insurance actually takes up the cost, but um, then comes the next issue. Um, they are not taking up the whole cost, and not all insurance companies are taking the cost of COVID testing. Patients are reluctant to do tests because as far as they are concerned, they don't have symptoms. So it's very hard to convince them to do COVID testing. That's another issue, especially to, you know, hospitals, smaller hospitals. And invariably, again, when we're going to force these insurance companies to take up the cost, premiums are going to, I mean, increased premiums is definitely going to be forthcoming. And now look at the other aspect of it. Now, if you're admitting a patient and if, you, and if you're waiting for a COVID test, number one, it's going to increase the duration the patient is going to stay in the hospital. The second thing is, if you are suspecting a patient, every patient to be COVID positive until proven otherwise, there's no such thing as putting a patient in a double room or a, or a room, a, a three-bedded or a four-bedded room. Every room now is going to be a single-bedded patient, irrespective of how you're looking at it. 
So, you know, a patient's insurance may only allow him for a double bedded or a, a three bedded room. But right now, that patient has to go as a single bedded. That's going to incur cost again. So prolonged hospital stay, a bedding issue. And then when you are coming in and you're not sure of your status, every precaution is going to be taken from the nurses to the doctors who are going to be going in and out of the room. So disposables are going to increase as well. So next, next slide, please. And then when you take this patient, you're, let's say now you're going to start doing electives in the COVID area, which we are, some of the have already started. We have to talk about negative pressure OTs. Right now in my hospital where I work in, there's, we don't even have a negative pressure OT. So whether how that's going to change about in the future, I don't know. And then every patient, we are talking about PPEs, N95 masks, additional gowns, additional equipment to prevent aerosol droplet spread. And this is not cost per person, but cost per every individual who is there in the OT. From your scrub nurse to your runner, to your anesthetist, to your ENT, if you have an assistant. So you can imagine what kind of cost this is going to incur. And I doubt insurance companies are going to look at this as something that they are going to be willing to take up the cost because it's going to be a huge cost. And again, it will depend on the type of procedure, whether you're doing a, a, a simple, straightforward, let's say a biopsy in the neck, or whether it's going to be a skull-based uh, surgery or uh, airway surgery. You know, so then we're going to think about how we're going to minimize risk. We're going to start putting additional covers, microscope covers. There's so many things that have come out in the literature uh, in the recent weeks. And before the COVID era, if you look at all these subspecialties, ENT has already become one of the most expensive specialties in view of high usage of consumables and single use instruments. And don't forget, there's another element of whether there's emergency or elective cases, because in an emergency, you don't have much choice. It's going to put people at risk. You're going to take all the precautions necessary. But, you know, so it's anybody's guess where we're going. Next slide. So current impact in private practice at present, I think in general, most ENT surgeons in private practice have seen a reduction of about 70 to 80% of their normal outpatient practice. In part, it is due to the current movement control order. But we're also starting to see with the slight lifting up, we are seeing more and more patients in our clinics. And it's only a question of when we are going to be starting to do our electives. Some hospitals have actually started doing electives and we are now discussing how these hospitals are actually, how these doctors are actually going about it. Almost all elective cases have been postponed in the past few weeks. And I think only, as I mentioned, only, I think as far as I know, only two or three hospitals have resumed. And I foresee this to go on to the earliest, to at least end May, June, before some level of normalcy will come back. But things going back to normal, I think it's, going to be much longer than that. And last slide. So is there a light at the end of the tunnel? I guess we can expect some level of normalcy to come back in the next couple of weeks. Post-COVID era, some changes to day-to-day -day practice will be permanent. Rapid testing with more accuracy will also become available, which will assist in our management of our patients. And you know, it will, it will help hospitals stay and you know, help us in our overall management to reduce costs. Herd immunity and vaccine I hopefully will come sooner than later. And my last uh, statement would be, it is just a question of us weathering the storm for now and being optimistic for the future. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jivanan. You have painted a very sobering but relevant picture for all of us. I think um, this might be the new normal for ENT surgeries post-COVID era, at least in the next immediate one year. Professor Xiao, um, we would like to come back to you. Earlier, someone mentioned about postponing ENT surgeries. The question is, when do you think we should postpone ENT surgeries to? Do we use the end of our MCO or CB as Singapore calls their lockdown? Or until the end of the pandemic? What are your thoughts? Yes, thank you. That would be the substance of my next presentation. Um, during this time, there was on the chat, uh, chat talk, uh, some questions which I would like to take. One is on the use of uh, airtight goggles and face masks. Now, I think the basic principle is we do not want the COVID-19 to creep into your conjunctiva. So as you know, airtight goggles is the gold standard. You see that it has worked uh, when they were treating patients in Wuhan. So if you get hold of a face shield, it depends on its design. You find it's, its design is not going to allow your conjunctiva to be exposed then you can use a face shield, which is usually uh, more comfortable than airtight goggles. The other question was on what about homemade masks, right? Okay, 
homemade masks are not for surgery. For surgery, we still recommend N95. But homemade masks have a, have a use. When you wear a mask, you do not touch your nose and your mouth so easily. Remember, this COVID-19 is on the doorknob and uh, you do not want to touch the doorknob and touch your face. So that's why, that's why a cloth mask is useful. Yeah? And of course, with physical distancing and a cloth mask, it is going to help the general public. If someone with COVID-19 coughs into your face when you're wearing a cloth mask, you're going to catch COVID-19. Yeah? So um, there were some questions on uh, what PPE to use, uh, and I hope that I can answer these uh, with my lecture. So the first uh, question is, um, next slide please. Now, AGP, aerosol generating procedures. This, uh, this work was done because of SARS. And whenever we pass uh, something across uh, a liquid surface, you can form an aerosol. And aerosols are produced when there's an intubation, when you have ventilation, tracheostomy, or bronchoscopy. Yeah, next slide. And of course, for me, I'm interested in FES and AGP, uh, especially with the uh, uh, recommendations after that, the super spreader of Wuhan. And my colleague has looked this paper up. Next slide, please. It, it shows in a cadaver, you put fluorescein into the nasal mucosa, and you were to do a septoplasty, turbinectomy, etc., nothing comes out. None of the fluorescein will come out. If you, if you use a microdebrider, nothing comes out because a microdebrider has a suction. But if you use a drill, then much of the fluorescein can come out uh, outside the cadaver head. There are, of course, many uh, restrictions on this because it's a cadaver uh, uh, model, but it gives us an idea. Yeah, next. So, we are talk, let's talk about pre-operative testing. Uh, we go to a, a scenario where if you test, you will know. So if your test is positive, you make a decision on that. If it's negative, you can make a decision on that. Someone asked a question, if it's negative, isn't there a 30% chance of a false negative? Indeed, there is. There could be. Now, in Singapore, we are not testing. Yeah? We still do not have the facilities to test for elective cases. Now, look at this picture. Um, in Japan, there are 14,153 cases out of uh, 126 million people. Right? That's about the, the prevalence. Um, on Sunday, in the Sunday Times, I read there was a hospital in Japan, in Tokyo, that tested 76 patients who were admitted for other reasons. Some of them were for elective surgery. And out of, out of 76 of these patients, four were actually COVID positive. So there are asymptomatic patients out there who are COVID-19. Yeah? So it would depend on the prevalence of um, COVID-19 in your community for you to feel, have a feel, whether this patient who is asymptomatic you're operating on may or may not be positive. So next slide. So for the Singapore situation, yes, we have a huge number. We have 14,423 out of just 5.7 million people. But we have, we have COVID-19 in two different circumstances. If you look at the general population, we had 2,240 cases, right? And our prevalence is only 0.04. The large majority of cases in Singapore right now, unfortunately, were our good foreign workers, people who come to help us uh, do construction, etc. They live in dorms. And when they got, they got caught with COVID-19, it spread very quickly. So there are 12,183 cases this morning of foreign workers who live in dorms who have it. So out of the 322,000, it's almost a 4% chance, 4% of prevalence that they have. So from these numbers, we would know if you are going to operate on a foreign worker, uh, in, say in an emergency, we would have to be very, very careful. Yeah, okay. Next slide, please. So this is what we, we have worked out in my hospital. Yeah. For patients who are undergoing meningoplasty, meningotomy, thyroidectomy, parotidectomy, there is no opening of mucosa. So these are not AGP procedures. And so wearing a surgical mask is enough. For any cases that 
um, have exposure of mucosa where they are AGP we use at N95. Of course, for COVID positive, if it's a tracheostomy, we can always delay the tracheostomy for three weeks and by three weeks, usually the patient would not be COVID-19 positive already or we can proceed with a PAPR. Right? However, if there are patients who are COVID positive here, who are wearing an N95 mask help, we think so because the work on SARS-1, N95 uh, works to prevent transmission. Okay. Next slide, please. But besides just operating, remember, when we do one case, when we use the PPE, there are seven sets of PPE to be used. It's just not only the surgeon. And also, as the numbers of cases in uh, Singapore uh, ramped up, uh, we were told by anesthesia that they would rather conserve some of these anesthetic drugs like propofol, etc., for use for sedation in impending cases that can come from to the ICU. We are still very lucky in Singapore. We only have 20 patients in ICU out of 1,451 in hospital and out of the 14,423 cases. Okay, next slide, please. But we ought to anticipate there is a worldwide shortage of PPE. You see, in the United States, some of them say they do not have PPE anymore. In the UK, the doctors say they don't have PPE. So it is not so easy now for a country like Singapore to go to the world and say, hey, we just want to buy, we have money. People may not sell you the PPEs. Yeah? So we have to try to conserve our resources. Next slide, please. So this is how we prioritize our cases. If it's life threatening, organ threatening, yes, we will do it. Right? For example, I do P3 tumors. If it's causing blindness, we proceed. The CSF leak, we proceed. Right? Biopsies of head and neck cancers. If it's not life threatening, can we? like inverted papillomas, supposing you do a nasal polyp, it's not just doing this case alone. Um, after that, there's a post-op care, post-op cleaning. It all requires the use of PPE. Of course, in our hospital, cataracts, we have, we have stopped doing cataracts. And of course, not aesthetic surgery. What about tonsils? If a patient has tonsillitis, yes, it may not be life-threatening, but we can up it and we can proceed to do the case with an N95. Yeah? Okay, next slide, please. Again, my acknowledgements to my colleague. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Xiao. Thank you, gentlemen. We have some time left and a lot of questions have popped up on our YouTube channel. Dr. Kujit, may I hand over this session to you to take over the Q&A session with our speakers? Thank you. All right, thank you. I have the next 10 minutes to answer some of these questions. Very interesting questions. Thank you very much to my panel members. Uh, I think uh, one question that probably Baha could answer, uh, Professor Baha, on uh, tracheostomy. Uh, I think you can see the questions on tracheostomy. When you do a tracheostomy, uh, what would be the best uh, guidelines that is recommended? Whether do you do tracheostomy when the COVID test is uh, negative? And I have an additional question because a lot of them are using this plastic box that they put over the patient before they do the surgery and they feel that there is probably one way to do. Probably you answer the first part of it, quickly answer the second part of it then. Uh, we can't hear you, Baba. Yeah, we, need, we need you to unmute. Unmute. I'm sorry, sorry guys. Um, the, we are not following any specific guidelines actually uh, whether it should be uh, you know uh, only one test or second test and whatnot but i think is what is recommended is we do one test for any patient when you want to bring to the operating theater test them for covid 19. if it is negative but you still need to practice uh, all these protective uh, measures that i mentioned just now where you will have to gear up and whatnot and treat non-covid as covid 19. That's the best measure because let's say the first test negative, the second test negative, but you're still having doubt, you still go to, you know, back to the square one. Uh, because if you have had doubt, then you are still scared. I, I, I think wh whether the patient is uh, negative or not, you still need to be protected. And, you know, I think the, uh, just one test alone probably is good enough. And, uh, Prof. Sia, 
Uh, there was a question that says the N95 prevents particles larger than 0 0.3 micron, but the coronavirus is 0 0.1 micron. So, uh, don't you think so? N95 will be protective enough. You also mentioned something in your presentation. There is an N99. Uh, can you give us something on that? Because N99, I think, yeah. is un I I'm not seeing one in my part of the world. Yeah. Thank you very much for the question. Indeed, uh, 0 0.3 microns is actually, uh, by industry standard, the most penetrating small particle. A 0 0.1 micron particle cannot penetrate through a mask. It's, it's well, it's, you can't say it's too small, but it just doesn't have enough mass, enough mass to come through. It must uh, aggregate with something that's 0 0.3 microns before it can come through. And that's why all the research has been on 0 0.3. And that's how it works, right? That's how, zero, that's how in the studies that show uh, in SARS-1, N95 is effective. N99, okay, N95 mask was not created for doctors. It was created for the industry, for particles, uh, engineering, etc. So N95 is simply making a mask with a mesh that, that prevents 99% of 0 0.3 micron particles from coming through. And of course, that reduces your oxygen supply quite a bit too. Yeah. And what about sterilizing an N95 and use it again? You know, sometimes there will be areas I really, where I, you cannot N95. I have, I, I really dread to see the day when we have to sterilize an N95. You see, this must are made to not to be reused. It's like a micro debrider. Yeah. So uh, that's why we want to conserve resources and not operate too freely because we may not be able to get N95. By the time we have to start washing our N95, we are in serious trouble. Yeah, it's not about surgery anymore. It's about healthcare workers taking care of COVID patients in the ICU, etc. Yeah. Okay, Prof. Baha, if, uh, will you do a tracheostomy on a COVID positive patient? I'm sure ICUs will ENTs to do a tracheostomy in some of the patients. So would you do it? That's the question asked by one of the US. Tracheostomy in oh. COVID patient. Yeah, tracheostomy in COVID patient. If there is an indication, we have to do. We have to do because when there is indication, we have to do. But the timing is important and how we go about it is important. Timing wise, what has been advised is uh, don't do early tracheostomy. We can do it later because during early tracheos, um, you know, the early uh, infection, there's a high burden of viral load. There's a, a huge viral load at that point of time where you want to avoid all these, um, you know, uh, virus exposures and whatnot. So probably you can delay it to later, right? And then when you do it, you must, as I mentioned before in my slide, uh, take proper precaution, all gear up and whatnot. Uh, the be the good team in the operating theater so that you don't spend too much time in the operating theater so that you just go in you do the tracheostomy and then you come up that's how we should go about it okay now we'll shift to jj on the finance part now insurances uh, may or may not pay for the entire ot team they may be using uh, n95s ppes and I think you did mention in your talk that that's going to increase costs. Uh, how is it so far? Do insurance companies pay or, or there are issues? I haven't done an elective case for middle of March. So I really don't know. And, um, but I think uh, you have been negotiating with, um, with some of the insurance companies with regards to COVID testing. And because this is uncharted territory, so with, when we, 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 this is really uncharted territory for both of both sides of the game. It's new for us. It's new for the insurance company as well. So you can already see from in, in um, coverage of COVID testing, there is a wide variance across the board from the insurance companies, but they are slowly sort of coming on board. But I think ultimately in Malaysia, at least central bank has to play a role in directing these insurance companies to decide what can be covered and what cannot be covered. Because ultimately, with the insurance game, we all know that, yeah, they will take a hit this year. But what they're going to do is they will increase premiums again next year. So 
looking at the economic situation is very sobering because there's talk about the the Great Depression, or something similar to the Great Depression, people are going to lose their jobs, companies are going to be, you know, hard pressed for cash. So this is going to be something that's going to be there for the next six months to a year, year and a half. And how this will, you know, go on to, to uh, impact coverage of employees and employers, employees, it's going to be very difficult. So right now, the question whether they cover or not, I've got no answer to that. I don't know because we haven't done anything. What about you? You have started doing cases right could you yeah single the companies uh, insurance companies are still are not forthcoming to pay for the covid test uh, they're still negotiating but so far when it comes to the ppes and the uh, the consumables in the ot they have not uh, made much of a comment but i think uh, we tell the insurance company if you pay for the covid test and if it is negative maybe there'll be lesser ppes that will be used in the operating room and these patients are lower risk. Um, that's so far we are still negotiating. Uh, the other question is maybe Prof Xiao can help us answer where no one has mentioned anything about children. Uh, we do see right now because children are at home with the parents, they become more mischievous. You may have foreign bodies in the nose, uh, in the ears. Is it safer to do this case under GA or LA with full PPE or do we do COVID tests on these kids? Uh, because there are school, two school of thoughts. Some feel that uh, it is unlikely for kids to get COVID, and uh, but then uh, they are spreaders. That is what we were told. So, what is your opinion when it comes to the pediatric ENT group? Okay, I don't see kids. I'm lucky I don't have to see them. But this is what I would think. If it's an ear, it's fine, right? Uh, it's not AGP. In the nose, a foreign body in the nose could well be AGP. Yeah, so take precautions, and I would say use an N95 and uh, goggles. Treat it as if the patient treat it as if that patient has has uh, COVID-19. It's not practical to test everybody for COVID-19. It's not not practical. You have to take uh, steps to to protect yourself. Yeah, that's important. Okay, we'll have the last two questions. Uh, there are doctors, may not be ENT doctors, who use air purifiers in the clinic, thinking that will reduce the impact of uh, uh, the viral spread. Some are also using UV sterilizers, thinking that that will help putting their mask for under UV sterilization. What's your opinion? Maybe, uh, Prof. Sia? Okay, the mask. The mask protects us because the surface of the mask can catch all this 0.3 micron uh, stuff. Yeah? So a mask is not meant to be reused. So I wouldn't recommend that you put a UV light on it and expect it to work, etc. Remember, when you take the mask off, that is a time when you can actually infect yourself. Yeah? Uh, we don't use air purifiers in, the, in our clinic. Uh, our clinic is designed so that Air is exchanged very quickly, uh, uh, every minute. Yeah. All right. So, the final question for all of you all: uh, telehealth and artificial intelligence. Uh, I probably all of you all can tell us. Tell me in one minute or two, uh, or maybe two minutes. What's your opinion in telemedicine as far as ENT is concerned? Uh, do you think there will be a role to play? Uh, patients sometimes have What's your opinion, Prof. Sia, Baha, and then finally with Dr. Jivanan? We, in ENT, we need to see. And if there's nobody to insert a scope into the ear for us to see the ear, I don't think we can give a diagnosis. We will be as much useful as a country GP. Of course, country GP can treat, but to have a specialist opinion, you need some form of endoscopy. Thank you. Baha, Baha you come from a place where the May be well, earlier, may not be earlier, but what's uh, we, We're quite advanced here, you know. Uh, we're using a lot of um, uh, Webex, uh, Zoom and whatnot. Um, I think telemedicine is here to stay probably. Um, uh, I, I think probably it's a, uh, it's a good tool for you to do sc uh, screening. Probably you can't do much of an examination and whatnot and you know treat the patient via telemedicine but as point of screening i think it's a good idea to use telemedicine 
Okay, Dr. Jivanan, maybe you can also say something about artificial intelligence so that we can also diagnose patients using artificial intelligence at this point of time so that we know what, what to operate, what we don't need to operate. Yeah, I think the role of uh, artificial intelligence using web-based apps are actually quite good because patients can actually use this help to, to risk stratify themselves. There are some very good things that have come out from the US. There was one from India, from Apollo Hospital in the early stages, which actually gives you a very good risk stratification for COVID per se. Uh, so I think there is a role, but as far as telemedicine goes, I think there is huge potential in this area in ENT. To, to keep it very short, Sia, Prof. Sia is absolutely correct in saying that our patients, a lot of us are dependent on the scopes to decide what is you know, going on with these patients. But we can use telemedicine as a tool for our follow-up patients to see whether they are, they are compliant with their treatment, whether they are doing right things, rather than getting them to come more frequent to the hospitals, maybe we can cut those visits and, you know, we can reduce. And um, yes, there should, I mean, our hospital is already looking, uh, I think we were looking at Oncomat as a, as a potential thing for telemedicine. We were having a meeting and a briefing tomorrow. So I think telemedicine, definitely there is a, a, an upcoming role. And um, though I don't say it's limited in ENT practice, but, you know, patient education, follow-up visits, um, these things where we can actually use it to some extent, not completely. Oh, thank you. All right, that's good. So we have gone beyond five minutes of our time. Um, and uh, the final a final statement, which I got from the uh, web is, would it be a good suggestion that all ENT surgeons should use N95, regardless whether you're doing a surgery or seeing patients in the, uh, in the ward or in the clinic as a norm? Do all of you agree with that? It would be ideal to protect yourself, but we come from the angle of a conservation of resources. You would not be able to have N95 all the time. So that's why we still use a surgical mask. Yeah. Okay, thank but you. Preferably so I think N95. N95, superb. Okay, so in the interest of time, uh, I would like to thank all of you all and also thank the audience. I must thank uh, CBOS, the, the providers of this conference broadcasting uh, company that we worked with and also medical conference partners under Didi Kwa who have helped us to get this thing together. I will now hand it over back to Didi Kwa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kujit, Professor Xiao, Professor Baharudin, and Dr. Jivanan. We really appreciate this webinar and I think it's been an afternoon well spent. It has been definitely an engaging one hour. To our audience who join us today, thank you for joining us and for interacting. If you found this webinar useful and would like more, more of such webinars, please subscribe to this YouTube channel and leave us a message here too. If there are topics that you would like us to cover in future webinars, do share your feedback with us. Until we meet next time, stay safe and take great care. Have a peaceful evening and to our Muslim friends, Salamat Babuka Puasa. Thank you. <laughs>